Hello, and welcome to Lessons in Tanya. Today we are in Lesson 4. Up to this point, the Tanya has taught us in Chapter 1 about the animal soul uh, and the uh, influence the evil inclination has over it, and the divine soul and its connection with the Yitzer Tov, the uh, inclination to do good. And we also have learned uh, in last week about the anatomy of the divine soul and the anatomy of a soul in general, how it's really made up of two parts uh, and further breaks down into ten total uh, uh, aspects. The, f the uh, th first part is the mind, which is made up of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And the, the uh, last part, the seven lower sephirot, if you will, the seven midot, or seven emotions. Um, by the way, midot doesn't mean emotions, generally it's translated to mean rules, but seven, the seven ruling things, they rule your emotions. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the seven lower uh, sephirot, which regulate our emotions, or are tied to our emotions. Okay. Uh, this week, uh, we are going to, to learn about the three garments of the soul, okay? Um, when you, you don't always wear the same garment, but it's always the same you inside the garment. The same thing is true of the soul. These three garments of the soul we're going to talk about are three ways the soul may present itself, but it's really the same soul inside but there's three different ways the, the soul expresses itself, okay? Um, and so it, we begin in Tanya chapter 4. In addition, every divine soul, uh, nefesh el kit in the Hebrew, every divine soul possesses three garments. <clears throat> Uh, speak, uh, I'm sorry, possesses three garments. Thought, speech, thought, speech, and action. Expressing themselves in the 613 commandments of the Torah. In the, uh, four, when a person actively fulfills all of the precepts which require physical action and which his power of, with his power of speech, he occupies himself with expounding all of the 613 commandments and their practical applications. And with his power of thought, he comprehends all that is comprehensible to him in the partis, that's partis is the four levels of understanding, we'll talk about it in a minute, of the Torah, then the totality of the 613 organs of the soul are clothed in the 613 commandments of the Torah. Okay, um, let's talk about these, these uh, uh, three garments. Thought, speech, action. These are the three ways that our soul expresses itself in, in ourselves, in the universe really. Um, and one of them is different from the others, thought. We'll talk about that in, uh, as we continue. <coughs> but there are three ways in which our soul expresses itself, three garments. And um, it's not always the same one, okay? It's like you're always wearing the same garment. But there are three different garments. And so the Torah expresses itself in us in what we do, and what we say, and what we think. The Baal Shem Tov taught the, this concept of the three garments uh, and the way in which they express themselves in the world. It says, <clears throat> And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, uh, Speak in to the Bnei Yisrael, and say to them, When you come over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then shall you appoint for yourselves cities that will be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer who kills a person unintentionally 
shall flee there too, and they shall be to you cities for refuge for the avenger. That's uh, Numbers or Bami Bar 35, 9 through 12. Rabbi uh, uh, Reb Levi Yitzhak uh, of Berdovich, uh, taught the name in the name of the Baal Shem Tov. In other words, he said that the Baal Shem Tov said that these three cities of the, the three cities of Yef, refuge, three the three cities of refuge, um, and there were three cities on each side of the Jordan, represent the three garments of the soul, thought, speech, and action. So this is a teaching that is supposed to go back to the Baal Shem Tov. It also actually goes back to the Torah. Uh, these are derived more directly from the Torah. That's derived by allegory. But we can literally derive these from the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. But the word is very near unto you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So here we have the Torah in our mouth and in our heart and in our actions. Deuteronomy 30, 14. There is a, a, another strong parallel of these three garments of the soul uh, that we find. We'll come back to it. Let's, let's go ahead and get back to Tanya here. Specifically, the faculties of Chabad in his soul are clothed in the comprehension of the Torah, which he comprehends in partis. Partis, we said, is the shot, ramez, drash, and sowed. It's the literal the implied, the allegorical, and the mystical meaning of the scriptures, all combined. So it's all four levels of understanding. Uh, to the extent his mental capacity and the supernal root of his soul, and the midot, namely fear and love, <clears throat> together with their offshoots and ramifications, are clothed in the, full, in, <clears throat> in the fulfillment of the commandments in deed and in word, namely in the study of the Torah, which is the equivalent of all of the commandments. For, the love, for love is the root of all the 248 positive commands, all originating in it and having no true foundation without it, inasmuch as he who fulfills them in truth truly loves the name of Elohim and desires to cleave to him in truth. For one cannot truly cleave to him except through the fulfillment of the 248 commandments, which are the 248 organs of the kingdom. Okay, so when we, <clears throat> when we observe the positive commandments, the things Elohim told us to do, and when we do it out of pure motives, we do it because we are driven to love Yahweh and we want to express our love for Yahweh by doing these positive things he asked us to do. So he asked us to keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath. He asked us to uh, uh, observe Yom Kippur or, or observe various festivals. Um, the, the things that he, he asked us to do, we do because we love him, and therefore we want to express our love to him by doing them. We, this love for Yahweh is derived from the knowledge of Torah that we understood that was the wisdom of Torah. We see this whole process, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding flowing down then into the love of Yahweh, and when that flows down into the love of Yahweh, it's going to express itself in a desire, and the Yitzhak, yielding to the Yitzhar Tov, a desire, a natural inborn desire to observe Torah, to observe the 248 uh, positive commandments. As it is written, there is an ex and explained elsewhere, whilst fear is the root of the 365 prohibitive commands, fearing to rebel against the supreme king of kings, the holy one, blessed be he, or still deeper, fear than this, when he feels ashamed in the presence of the divine greatness to rebel against his glory and do what is evil in his eyes, namely, 
any of the abominable things hated by Elohim, which are the Kelipot, the, the Kelipot, and the Sitra Achra, which draw their nurture from the man below and have their hold in him through the 365 prohibitive commandments that he violates. In other words, when we observe the uh, uh, commandments, the don'ts, the commandment, the negative commandments, the commandments against doing things, for example, don't eat, don't eat shellfish or, or don't eat pork, we do that out of an awe and a reverence and a quote-unquote fear, a respect for Yahweh, that also results from that same knowledge in us, because the Torah then becomes our opinion, and we have an awe for Yahweh, and that awe and that fear and that respect causes us to want to not, to not want to eat shellfish, to, uh, uh, or to resist the desire to eat shellfish. There's still a conflict that goes on because we're still influenced by the uh, the Yitzhara. Uh, remember, this is about the Bainani. We're talking about the man that hears both has both inclinations, and the Tanya is presenting us with the key to to overcoming the Yitzhara. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now these. Three garments derive from the Torah and its commandments. Although they are called garments of the Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshoma, their quality nevertheless is infinitely higher and greater than that of the Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshoma themselves, as explained in the Zohar. Because the Torah and the Holy One, blessed be He, are one, the meaning of this is that the Torah, this is profound. Okay, so take note of this. <clears throat> The Torah, which is the wisdom and will of the Holy One, blessed be He, and His glorious essence are one, since He is both the knower and the knowledge. And so on, as explained above in the name of Maimonides. Well, it's, okay, it'll continue here, but what it's saying here is that the Torah and Yahweh are one. The Torah is Yahweh, and Yahweh is Torah. The Torah is well, and we'll explain this in a moment. But if we understand that the the connection between the Torah and the Messiah, the Messiah is the incarnation of the Torah. We're talking about the Torah is the incarnation of the middle pillar of the Godhead, the Son of Yah, which is the whole point that we've been talking about. You can see how well this fits for us as Nitzurim, okay? Because the Son of Yah is the middle pillar of the Godhead, which is the fullness of the everlasting Godhead, because it brings the outer, to the middle pillar of the Godhead brings together the outer two pillars and harmonizes them, which is why it's the fullness of the everlasting Godhead. And so when the Torah is within us, the Messiah is within us, Elohim is within us and guiding us. And let us continue. Uh, and although the Holy One, blessed be He, is called Ein Sof, and His greatness can never be fathomed, in other words, we can't really comprehend Ein Sof, uh, His greatness can never be, and no thought can apprehend Him at all, and so are also His will and His wisdom, as it is written, there is no searching of His understanding, and can you, by searching, find Elohim, and again, for my thoughts, are not your thoughts. Nevertheless, it is in this connection that has been said, where you find the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be He, there you also find His humility. Okay? <clears throat> so what is, the, what is His humility? What does this mean? For the Holy One, blessed be He, has compressed His will and His wisdom within the 613 commandments of the Torah and their laws, as well as within the combinations of the letters of the Torah, the books of the prophets, and the hagiography, the, the ketuvim, the, the writings. And in the uh, exposition thereof, which are to be found in the uh, Agadot and the Midrashim of our rabbis of blessed memory. 
All this is in order that the neshoma, the rock, and the nefesh in the human body should be able to comprehend them through its faculty and understanding and to fulfill them as they can be fulfilled in act, speech, and thought, thereby clothing itself with all its ten faculties in these three garments. In other words, the Word <laughs> is Elohim. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. The Word of Elohim is Elohim. And the Word became flesh in the Messiah. <clears throat> Therefore has the Torah been compared to water. Just as water descends from a higher to a lower level, so has the Torah descended from its place of glory, which is his blessed will and wisdom, for the Torah and the Holy One, blessed be he, are one and the same, and no thought can apprehend him at all. Thence the Torah has progressively descended through hidden stages, stage after stage, with the descent of the worlds until it clothed itself in corporeal substances and in things of this world comprising almost all the commandments of the Torah, their laws, and the combinations of material letters written with an ink in a book, namely the 24 volumes of the Torah, which means is the whole Tanakh, the 24 volumes of the Tanakh. So the Torah, the, the Elohim, uh, descends to this world in the form of the Word. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And takes on corporal form. I wasn't planning on this, but I'm going to grab another book. prophecy in the Apocrypha in the book of Baruch that is extremely pertinent to this that I thought I feel I should share and I didn't have it in my notes so I didn't have it prepared but that's fine I just went and got it in the book of Baruch and it won't take you but a moment to find this Okay, uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 29. Who has gone up into heaven and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? This is referring to the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay, it's actually virtually quoting from it. Who has gone over the sea and found her and will buy her for pure gold? This is talking about the Torah. No one knows the way to her, nor is it concerned about the path to her. But he who knows all things knows her. He found her by his understanding. He who prepared the earth for all time filled it with four-footed creatures. He who sends forth the light, and it goes, called it, and it obeyed him in fear. Uh, the stars shone in their watches, and they're glad. He called them, and they said, Here we are. They shone with gladness for him who made them. This is our Elohim. No other can be compared to him. He found the whole way to Da'at, to knowledge, and gave her to Jacob his servant and to Israel whom he loved. This is all talking about the Torah. Afterwards, she appeared upon earth and lived among men. So the Torah then actually appeared upon earth and lived among men. She is the book of the commandments of Elohim and the Torah that endures forever. All who hold her fast will live, and those who forsake her will die. Um, this is Baruch chapter 3, verse 29. So here we have very much this concept of the Torah, the mind of, of Yahweh, coming to earth as the Torah 
in corporal form, which is very similar to what the Tanya is saying here, just taking it a step further. Thus, since the Torah and its commandments clothe all the ten faculties of the soul with all its 613 organs from head to foot, in the soul is altogether truly bound up in the bundle of life with Elohim, and the very light of Elohim envelopes and clothes it from head to foot, for it is written, Elohim is my rock, I will take refuge in him. As it is written also with favor, or with will, or its own, will you com uh, compass him as with a shield? <clears throat> this is, of course, referring to uh, the armor of Elohim, and um, we'll talk about this in a, later as we continue. That is to say, with his blessed will and wisdom, which are clothed in his Torah and its commandments. So the Torah is uh, an outfit, a clothing. And it's clothing that we wear in our speech, in our thoughts, and in our actions, our three expressions of our soul. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks about the three manifestations of the Ruach HaKadosh, the nine manifestations of the Ruach HaKadosh. And he breaks the nine down, the, the nine can be broken down into three categories. The first three that uh, uh, parallel wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The word of wisdom, the uh, spiritual discernment, discerning of spirits, it says in the Greek, but the, the word spirit is singular in the Aramaic, so in Aramaic, it's discerning of the spirit, which is the Aramaic way of saying spiritual discernment. So it's spiritual discernment. Discernment is understanding. It is breaking down and categorizing and classifying. Okay. And then word, the, the uh, word of knowledge, which parallels dot knowledge. Then uh, that those three express the Ruach HaKadosh in how we think, okay? Three of these manifestations of the Ruach HaKadosh manifest or express the Ruach HaKadosh in a supernatural way in how we speak. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. And the other three express the Ruach HaKadosh in what we do, in um, um, faith, because faith expresses itself, as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, in what we do, okay? But also in uh, works of kind, in, in, in healing, which is parallels chesed, loving kindness, works of healing, uh, uh, gifts of healing, sorry, and in what's called in the Aramaic of 1 Corinthians is chela, which is the Aramaic translation in uh, Chronicles for Gevra, severity, but in this sense it also has the nuance of miracles, of supernatural works, and also over of authority and power over the demonic realm, over spirits, okay? So, but all of these are expressions of the Ruach HaKadosh, manifestations of the Ruach HaKadosh within us, in things that we do. So you see the three manifestations, the nine manifestations break down into the three garments. Okay. They break down into the three garments of, of the, uh, uh, the three garments of the soul as well. Okay. Um, hence it has been said, better is one hour of repentance and good deeds in this world than the whole life of the world to come. For the world to come is that state where one enjoys the eff, uh, effulgence of the divine presence, which is the pleasure of comprehension, yet no created being, even celestial, can comprehend more than some reflection of the divine light. That is why the reference is to effulgence of the divine presence. But as for the essence of the Holy One, blessed be he, no thought can apprehend him at all, except when it apprehends and is clothed in the Torah 
and its mitzvot. In other words, Elohim himself, Ein Sof, the Infinite One, is beyond our comprehension. The only way we're able to comprehend him is through the Torah, which is the finite image of Elohim, the scaled down. The Torah is the image of Elohim. It's what the Tanya is teaching, which means that the Torah is the Son of Yah and is the incarnation of the Godhead. The, the, you see why, as Nazarenes, we can really learn from the Tanya? Because it's teaching, it's teaching a lot of Nazarene Judaism here. All right. Um, not only then, when it, uh, not only then does it truly apprehend and is clothed in the Holy One, blessed be He, inasmuch as the Torah and His Holy One, blessed be He, are one and the same. For although the Torah has been clothed in lower material things, it is by way of illustration like embracing the King. There is no difference in regard to the degree of closeness and attachment to the king, whether while embracing the king. The latter is then wearing one robe or several robes, so long as the royal person is within them. Likewise, when the king, for his part, embraces one with his arm, even though it is dressed in the robes, as it is written, and his right hand embraces me, which refers to the Torah, which was given by Elohim's right hand, which is the quality of chesed and water. And you notice in Revelation, when Elohim is on the throne, the sealed book, which, by the way, in part represents the Torah, the word, is in his right hand. And when in uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapters, uh, starting in chapter 8, when the Messiah, the Messiah as the high priest in the heavenly holy of holies, as referring back to Psalm 110, is at the right hand, okay? Because the Torah is at the right hand. The Messiah is the Torah, the Messiah is Yahweh. The other Yahweh in Psalm 110, where Yahweh says to my Adon, my Yahweh, uh, well, it says my Adon, but then later on it, it says Yahweh at your right hand. The Messiah text says Adonai is the right hand, but the Messiah indicates the original reading was Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh at your right hand. So the Yahweh at the right hand of Yahweh in Psalm 110 is the Messiah because the Messiah is the Torah and the Torah is the right hand in the right hand of Yahweh. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit here about the garment before we conclude. Remember we talked in Tanya 4, it mentioned the shield. And all of this ties back to the idea of the armor of Elohim. Now, you may have thought that the armor of Elohim is a New Testament, so-called New Testament concept, because Paul talks about it in, um, in Romans 13, verses 12 through 14, obviously, famously in the book of Ephesians, and also in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Um, and we're not going to look at those passages because I'm sure that you're probably familiar with them. If you're not, you can certainly look them up. Um, I want to talk about the garment of Elohim and conversely to the garment of Elohim being spiritually naked. In other words, not being dressed in the Torah, not having the Torah as the garment of our soul in our speech, in our action, and in our thought. Revelation 3.17 says, Because you can, I'm sorry, because you have said that you are rich and I have grown, and I have grown rich, quoting Hosea 12.9, and I am not in need of anything, and you do not know that you are weak and miserable and poor and naked. What does it mean by naked there? Also in Revelation 16.15, Behold, he comes like a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. What garments, plural, what garments? Lest he should walk naked and they should see his shame. It's not physical garments it's talking about. It's being having a naked soul, a soul that's not wearing the, the three garments of the soul. The Torah in our speech and in our action and in our thoughts. 
Okay, what, what do we mean here, naked? It's a reference back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 in the Torah, verses 7 through 11. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves garments. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden toward the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden. And Yahweh called unto the man and said unto him, Where are you? By the way, that's a whole mirage on that. Uh, he knew where he was. But uh, obviously he was all-knowing and omnipresent. <coughs> it said that... Uh, um, he was actually asking Adam, according to the Midrash, to, prompting Adam to take a spiritual inventory of himself. Where are you? And the, according to the Midrash, as a man approaches 50, a messenger comes to him and asks him the same question, basically prompting him to take a spiritual inventory of himself. Where are you? Not where are you physically, but where are you spiritually? You've had this nephesh, this soul that I've given you for nearly 50 years now. What have you done with it? Okay. So they were naked. Well, they were not. They were spiritually. Let's, let's talk. Let's see what the Zohar says about this. And volume 1, verse 50, uh, page 53a in the Zohar. And Adam said, Elohim took from him his, uh, the armor of the bright and holy letters. The letters of what? The letters of the Torah among other things, the word. Okay, so according to this Midrash, he realized he was naked because he was actually dressed before. He was wearing the garment. His soul was wearing a garment. And, and, uh, with which he had been encompassed. And we, he and his wife were afraid, perceiving that they had been stripped. So it says, and they knew that they were naked. At first they had been invested with these glorious crowns, which gave them protection and exemption from death. When they sinned, they were stripped of them, and then they knew the death was calling them, that they had been deprived of their exemption, and that they had brought death on themselves and on all of the world. <clears throat> so, at first they were naked, but before they were, I'm sorry, before they were naked, they weren't. They were naked. They were ashamed when they realized they were naked because they weren't naked before. They were. They had the garment of their soul before. Okay. Um, this actually ties into some events at Mount Sinai. So let me read in the Torah, Exodus chapter thirty-three, verses one through six. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Depart, go up hence you and your people that you have brought up out of the land of Egypt onto the land of which I have sworn unto Abraham, to Yitzhak and to Yaakov, saying, Unto your seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Yevusite, onto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. And when the people heard these things, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments, his garments. And Yahweh said unto him, unto Moshe, Say unto the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people. If I go into the midst of you for one moment, I shall consume you. Therefore now put off your garments from you, or your ornaments from you, that I may know what to do unto you. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of the garments or the ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. So the Torah is saying is that they had the, the spiritual garments that were stripped from them. They actually gave them up, unfortunately. Well, look, the Talmud gives an explanation of this. Rabbi Simla lectured, and when the Israelites gave precedence to we will do over we will hearken, 600,000 ministering angels came and set two crowns upon each man of Israel, 
One is a reward corresponding to we will do, and the other is a reward for we will hearken. But as soon as Israel sinned, 1,200,000 destroying angels descended and removed them, as it is said, and the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb, which we just read in Exodus 33. Rabbi Hama, son of Rabbi Hamina, said, At Horeb they put them on, and at Horeb they put them off. At Horeb they put them on, as we have stated, at Horeb they put them off, as it is written. And the children of Israel stripped themselves, etc. Rabbi Yochanan observed, and Moses was privileged and received them all, for in proximity thereof it is stated, and Moshe took the tent. Exodus 33, 7. Resh Lakish said, Yet the Holy One, blessed be he, will return them to us in the future. For it is said, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be unto their head. Isaiah 35, 10. For the joy from the old shall be upon their heads. This is from the Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 88a. <clears throat> this is talking about the armor of Elohim, the garment of the soul. <clears throat> but there's more. The Zohar elaborates upon this. The Zohar Volume 1, page 63b, <clears throat> Rabbi Hayah said, The world was in a state of pover poverty and misery from the time Adam transgressed the commandment of the Almighty until Noah came and offered up a sacrifice, which, it, uh, which its pr prosperity returned. Rabbi Yosef said, The world was not properly settled, nor was the earth purged from the defilement of the serpent, until Israel stood before Mount Sinai. So according to the Zohar, something really special happened at that moment when Israel stood before Mount Sinai. This was the wedding of Israel to the Messiah. Yes, the Messiah. Remember, though, the Messiah, according to Revelation, is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So the, the, and the, uh, uh, the Targum, to the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, uh, expresses that this is, is an allegory of the marriage of Yahweh to Israel at Mount Sinai, where they first laid off the tree of uh, hold of the tree of life, and so established the world firmly. In other words, remember when Adam and Chava sinned, okay, they were prohibited from taking hold of the tree of life. But when they came to Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai, the Torah was offered to them, the tree of life was offered to them. Had not Israel backslid and sinned before the Holy One, blessed be he, they would never have died since the scum of the serpent had been purged out of them. But as soon as they sinned, the first ta tablets of the Torah were broken, those tablets which spelt complete freedom, freedom from the serpent, who is the end of all flesh. When the Levites rose up to slay the guilty, the evil serpent went in front of them, but he had no power over Israel because they were girt with a certain armor which protected them against his attacks. When, however, Elohim said to Moses, Therefore now put off the ornaments from thee, Exodus 33, 5, this was the signal that they were placed in the power of the serpent that is indicated by the form uh, which, of the verb which shows that they were stripped by the hand of another. The ornaments, therefore, are those which they received at Mount Horeb at the time when the Torah was given to Israel. And again, in the Zohar, volume 1, page 52b. But after they sinned, they were not able to look even on the face of the deputy, speaking of Moshe. How was this? Because the children of Israel were deprived of their ornament from Mount Sinai, to wit, the armor which tower over them. 
<clears throat> so the Zohar and the Talmud are teaching that there is this garment of Elohim which is embedded in the Torah which uh, they initially had at Mount Sinai but when they apostatized they lost which uh, is a garment for our soul and this is what the Tanya is teaching us to put back on to clothe ourselves, to clothe our soul through our thoughts, our knowledge, our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. Um, it is the same armor that we read about in Paul's writings that also expresses itself likewise. <clears throat> and it is the Torah, the, it is actually a matter of putting the Torah on our soul and clothing our soul in the Torah, which is the Messiah. So it is like Paul talks about putting on the Messiah. Putting on the full armor of Elohim is putting on the Torah, is putting on the Messiah, is putting on the, the mind of Elohim. Okay? So that's what Tanya chapter 4 teaches us, and uh, we will continue next week with Tanya chapter 5 in Lesson 5. I hope that uh, you will join us then for Lesson 5 and Lessons in Tanya. Until then, Shalom.